thank you very much for having me. I drove over from Providence today. This is my first invited CCF event, so I'm really happy to be here talking to you guys. I take care of a lot of IBD patients over at Brown. So I'm going to talk to you today about the microbiome. It's my area of research and clinical interest and just kind of how it ties into what you're all experiencing in IBD. Um, there we go. So um, the, the brunt of this talk is going to be about the microorganisms that are present in our gut, how they got there, what they're doing, um, and what can go wrong, particularly as it relates to inflammatory bowel disease. And importantly, how we're learning that we may be able to manipulate these bacteria to treat um, both C. difficile, which I'm going to focus on, as well as IBD. And to avoid some confusion right from the get-go, I'm going to just throw these two terms at you. And they're pretty much used interchangeably in the literature and in the lay press. Microbiota are the microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, that live in an established environment. In this talk, we're going to be focusing on the gut. And you'll hear that um, term microbiome. Now, the microbiota is very vast and abundant. It is these uh, organisms, there are about 39 trillion of them in your gut. And just to put that in perspective, you have 30 trillion cells in your whole body. Where the microbiome is the genetic material that those microorganisms carry. So the number of, uh, of bacterial gene products, it's um, in the vastly in the millions, outnumbering our own DNA by many orders of magnitude. And it's that DNA that's kind of encoding for all these things that these bacteria are doing. So you may see those two terms used interchangeably, though they do differ a bit. And I love being a gastroenterologist because I can do cute poop emojis and talk about poop all the time. Um, just to kind of figure, you know, just kind of what we're looking at here. You know, your, your stool is about 75% water, more or less. And of the solid matter, depending on how much fiber in your diet, a lot of that is undigested fiber. Then another about 40% is just stuff, components of cells that slough off, blood cells, intestinal secretions. But about 30% of the dry weight of your stool is made up of bacteria. And one little tiny gram of stool, you can see that looks, has over 100 billion microbes. So it's big, big numbers. And traditionally, the way probably older people like me remember doing microbiology was culturing to grow these bacteria on culture dishes. And you had to kind of smear a little bit of whatever you were, you know, trying to get something to grow out of onto a culture medium. You had to like specifically know what you were looking for, feed those bacteria the right things to get them to grow, give them the right, right environment. But those traditional methods were really missing a lot. It was really only the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of what was present. And through modern molecular techniques, um, they're actually able to sequence and look for the genes themselves that a lot of these bacteria carry. And without doing all that culturing, they're able to just, it really opened up this whole universe that we never knew existed. And this interest in the microbiome, a lot of it funded in the kind of early, around 2000, early 2000s by the NIH, but it really opened up a big door into um, understanding both, you know, what was going on in our intestine and other kind of parts of our body. But to kind of just give an idea of the types of microbiome organisms that are present, um, there, are about, there are up to a thousand different species of bacteria in your gut. Um, and we think a lot about the bacteria, but there's also viruses, fungi, protozoa. And they're not just doing nothing. They're there with very specialized functions. They serve as a first line of defense. So, you know, protecting you from maybe some type of foodborne illnesses, things like this, other kind of pathogen bacteria, they kind of duke it out. Um, immune function, a lot to do with the development of the immune system in the body. There's a lot more understanding that kids are more prone to atopic and allergic diseases and things like this, maybe as a result of some early problems in the microbiome. Um, they nourish the cells of the colon. The bacteria in the colon break down the fibrous pot products in our stool, making short-chain fatty acids, and that's the main food source for the cells of our colon, and also producing vitamins, particularly vitamin K, folic acid. And the microbiome changes through the life cycle. I like to tell patients, you're pretty much, there's nothing, in, when you're inside your mother, you're sterile. And at that very first moment of birth is when you start to acquire your microbiome. And it really depends on the mode of delivery, obviously. Babies who are born vaginally are picking up microbes from the mom's rectum and vaginal area. Babies born by C-section, their first dose of microbes may be from the hospital worker's hands, the mom's skin. Depending on type of feeding, breastfed babies develop different microbiomes than bottle-fed babies. Babies that are premature, spending a lot of time in the NICU, or who get a lot of antibiotics, all that stuff can impact that microbiome. And then you reach just that, this is a very dynamic process over that first two to three years of life, but around two to three, you start to develop what's more of your core sort of stable colonizers. And they do fluctuate, and there's things that can you know, change them through life, particularly courses of antibiotics, 
very influenced by diet, but that stays stable for the large majority of our life cycle. And then as we get older, people become more frail. Um, we'll start to see decreased diversity of the microbes, different numbers of microbes that are, um, that are maybe more pathogenic, and that sort of ecosystem becomes compromised. So I do want to spend a minute on diet because there's a huge role in the microbiome. Everybody wants to know, how can I have a healthy microbiome? Okay, fiber. <laughs> That's um, one of the kind of key takeaways. Um, you can influence your diet very dramatically. I mean, you can influence your microbiome very dramatically by your diet. And they did this study a couple of years ago. It was fascinating. They looked at um, African Americans versus very genetically similar rural South Africans. And there are big differences in their baseline diets. So the African Americans, these were some guys living in Pittsburgh, average ate about 12 grams of fiber a day. About half of that was fat, typical Western American diet. Whereas the folks over in South Africa were eating 55 grams of fiber a day. That's an, it's a huge amount of fiber um, and a very low fat, uh, mostly vegetable fiber. And these two populations have very big differences in their colon cancer risk. The, um, the African Americans had 100 times the colon cancer risk than their counterparts. So what they said is, can we actually just swap diets and see what happens? And for two weeks, they admitted these guys into monitored units and fed them each other's diets. And they found that their microbiomes over that two-week period actually completely swapped, and they became un recognizable from their baseline. And they had increased markers. Those who had a healthy diet to begin with started to develop those increased markers of cancer risk and vice versa. Um, the healthy microbiome, I like to say, is like the rainforest. You think of a good rainforest, there's a whole bunch of different like plants and animals and species and insects. And it's in this great balance where everything is living together. It's very resistant to invaders or disease, and it's considered healthy. And then when your microbiome is unhealthy, kind of think of one that's been compromised by deforestation or I don't know, some chemicals thrown on it. The diversity is lower. Um, the ecosystem itself is sick. It's imbalanced. It's more susceptible to diseases, maybe insects and things like this. So what can go wrong in our guts? You know, we like to kind of very basically think, oh, there's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria. That's very much an oversimplification. A bacteria isn't bad, like E. coli in your colon isn't bad. E. coli in your bloodstream or in your urinary tract, then it's bad. But what we're um, really talking about with um, the microbiome is this concept of dysbiosis. So this slide, I'm sorry, looks you know, kind of scary, but the general idea is in the state of health, you have a diverse and abundant microbiota. All those bacteria, viruses, and stuff are doing their job um, in creating those short-chain fatty acids that keep the cells healthy. The cells make a nice little mucus layer that kind of keeps the bacteria out of contact with the cells. There's not a lot of direct inflammation. But then in dysbiosis-related conditions, one of them being inflammatory bowel disease, also after treatment with antibiotics, you get some of that microbiota diversity knocked out. You get a skewing in the bacterial species. The ones that normally are present at low levels may kind of overgrow. You get disruption of that mucosal barrier, um, initiation of the immune response, and inflammation. Most basic example of dysbiosis causing disease is C. difficile. And I'm sure probably about 10% of you in this room have had C. difficile or know someone who has. Um, in C. diff, typically exposure to antibiotics disturbs the microbiome, causes this dysbiosis, gives a little niche for C. diff to kind of get in, colonize, proliferate, start to multiply, produce a toxin that causes injury to the cells of the colon, diarrhea, colitis, inflammation, pain. Um, even though it's a disease treated, caused by antibiotics, we've always treated it with antibiotics that have direct activity against C. diff. Um, we used to use metronidazole a lot. Now it's mo mostly vancofidaxomycin. And one of the problems is recurrence is very common. So after a course of antibiotics for C. diff, you got about a 20% chance it's going to come back on you, more if you have IBD. That goes up to 40% after a first recurrence and so forth. And there are people that just kind of can't break out of that cycle. So the idea of breaking this cycle of this disease caused by dysbiosis by restoring all of the good bacteria into the colon that are missing. And this has been termed fecal microbiota transplant, or FMT. Some people say we should take the F word out of it because it's a little gross sounding fecal and call it intestinal microbiota transplant. But in any case, this restores that diversity, all those beneficial species that are supposed to be there. And it's very, very effective. Just with a single dose, 90% effective at terminating that ongoing cycle of C. diff infection. Um, the FDA does consider it a drug and biologic, though they permit its use to treat C. diff at this time. Um, this is not an FMT talk, just to kind of give you an idea how we do it. Um, you find and screen a donor, you're basically just like at the blood bank, you find someone healthy, clean living, low risk, no kind of uh, risk factors for dysbiosis causing disease. 
test them for infections in their blood and stool. You collect the fecal material. This is actually a picture that I took, um, mix it in some saline, draw it up into syringes, and I mostly give it colonoscopically. So during the course of a colonoscopy, when we're already in there, patients asleep and sedated, we kind of squirt the new, the new bugs in. Um, other places have used naso, nasogastric tubes or nasoduodenal tubes. Most people really, really hate that. Um, and um, the, um, also could be given as enema, um, colonoscopic, um, is another approach. I'm sorry, capsule is another approach that's starting to um, gain more traction, you know, eliminating the need to have a colonoscopy. So talking about the pathogenesis of IBD, how does this all factor into IBD? We know it's multifactorial. You have patients that have a genetic susceptibility to, the, to, to this immune overreaction or adherent immune response. There's certainly environmental triggers that we know about. Um, you know, I've seen people flare from antibiotics or travel, um, certainly to tell people to stay away from NSAIDs, smoking, big role in Crohn's disease in particular, um, and then certainly the diet. But now that we know more about the microbiome, we're understanding that those gut microbes themselves are a really critical key piece to the whole cycle and in inflammation in IBD. And IBD patients do have very unique and less diverse microbial flora and kind of a dysbiosis at baseline compared to non-IBD patients. And this graph just shows that Crohn's patients and ulcerative colitis patients, their microbiomes kind of cluster differently than each other, and both of them are very different from healthy controls. And they have less diversity, more pro-inflammatory bacteria, actually more bacteria that tend to adhere to the wall of the intestine and colon and cause trouble. Um, and the question is, is like the chicken and the egg. What came first? Is it the inflammation in the setting of Crohn's that's kind of causing damage to the bacterial populations? Or do the bacterial populations themselves at baseline are abnormal and that's creating the inflammation? And um, there's definitely some signal that people, even before developing IBD, before like in preclinical patients who are at high risk, you start to see changes in their microbiome before it even becomes apparent that they have IBD. And they've done some of those studies in children. But C. diff is a really serious problem for patients with IBD, and it's actually how I got into treating IBD was through my work in C. diff. It's very common. you got about a 10% risk in your lifetime with IBD that you're going to develop it, more often in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease involving the colon. Um, the diagnosis can be really challenging because the symptoms overlap. Obviously, there's diarrhea, pain. Um, you might see it even without preci precipitating antibiotics, which is, is different than in non-IBD patients. Um, it's a big problem when you have an IBD flare that we recommend that everybody with an IBD flare gets tested for C. diff because it is so common, but it can increase how long you're in the hospital, your colectomy risk is higher, higher mortality rates, which is pretty scary. Four times the risk of mortality around those flares when you have C. diff compared to when you don't. And treatment's difficult. It can be more refractory to treatment, five times the risk of uh, having a recurrence. And you know we're always questioning, what do we do with your immunos immunosuppressive therapies while you have these infections? So it's things that the doctors are struggling with. Um, so one question is, FMT, we know it works really, really well for non-IBD patients in getting rid of the C. diff. Does it work as well for in the setting of IBD? And is it even safe? And I can tell you this was very early on, probably 12 years ago. One of the first FMTs I did was in an elderly gentleman who had had very quiet IBD for years. He had been off all meds for over 20 years. Um, he developed these recurrent courses of C. diff after antibiotics. Um, his wife donated, I did a colonoscopic FMT, and nine days later, he experienced his first flare that he'd had in 20 years. So it made me wonder, is there some potential disruption that we did with these new bacteria that caused his body to have that response? And I had a similar patient who had very, very bad Crohn's colitis that became apparent after her FMT to treat C. diff. Um, so to help answer this question, Jessica Allegretti, who many of you may be familiar with, she's at Regular Women's, um, she designed an open label trial um, four sites across the U.S., we were one of them, where we had patients with IBD who also had at least two episodes of C. diff and were willing to undergo an open-label fecal transplant to, to treat their C. diff. And we wanted to see how does it work for the C. diff? Does it get rid of the C. diff as well? And how about the IBD outcomes? Does there any, is there any dangers maybe to doing this in patients with IBD? So 49 patients were treated, efficacy rate very high, 90% with the first dose, very similar to non-IBD patients, and those who failed, four to five were cured with a second dose using the same donor. Crohn's disease patients, 73% 73, 73 of them also had an improvement in their underlying Crohn's disease. Um, the rest were unchanged, and the ulcerative colitis, 62% had an improvement in their underlying IBD. And there was only one de novo new flare, which may or may not have been related to the FMT, but in this whole population of 49 patients. So can we then, 
knowing it works for C. diff and it works for IBD and C. diff, and um, knowing that IBD patients have this dysbiosis, can we do any alterations of the microbiome or FMT to treat IBD itself? And the question comes, you know, we know antibiotics are sometimes beneficial in IBD. Um, we use them in pouchitis and complications of Crohn's. Probiotics are somewhat effective in some populations of patients. Um, so we know that the bacteria um, altering them may be helpful. So what is the evidence for FMT and ulcerative colitis? Um, to start with, there have been four randomized controlled trials, one done in the Netherlands, one in Canada, two in Australia, involving about the same number of patients. Their protocols for FMT delivery differed. One was nasoenteric, um, the uh, others were enema administration or colonoscopic. And um, also there are kind of um, some involved just a single donor FMT. Some they actually pooled stool for multiple donors to make sure they had the right bacteria and gave it in um, very intensive regimens, even up to 40 times they would get FMTs. Um, so to pool the results of all these four studies together, there was a meta-analysis that was done, and that's the kind of thing at the bottom, the four studies, and it showed that the overall remission rate for the FMT-treated patients in these trials was 28% versus 9% with placebo, and that was significantly, significantly better than placebo. The endoscopic remission rate, which is a harder endpoint, was also higher, 14% versus 5%. And just to put this in perspective a little bit, these were mild to moderate patients, so not very severe, but these are our best biologics. And the trials from our best biologics showed response rates of between 17 and 30%, 38% with infliximab, vitalizumab. Um, so this approach is actually sort of the efficacy approaching that of biologic therapies. Very exciting. So what have we learned from these? It looks like FMT is safe in this population. There are factors that seemed to be more associated in these ulcerative colitis trials with a good response. Shorter so patients who had a shorter disease duration, who hadn't been sick as long, whose mucosal disease was more mild. Also, there was one study that showed there was a super donor. So certain bacterial species enriched in their, their stuff that was um, necessary for a response. And a lot of patients responded when they got material from that particular donor. Also, higher numbers of FMT may not be necessary. You might not have to do it 40 times. You know, maybe two or three times is enough. How about FMT for Crohn's? Much less evidence. Fewer randomized controlled trials. Um, I haven't updated this in a while, but um, there hasn't been anything really groundbreaking, to be honest, in the last year or two. Um, studies are, you can kind of, the effects are all over the place. Some it seemed to work, some it seemed didn't to work at all. Uh, but the clinical remission rates um, in certain studies looked excellent. Um, the problem is, is the endpoints were all very different. It's hard to really make any comparisons um, between these studies. Um, but overall, just not as uh, uh, overwhelmingly positive as ulcerative colitis. So where are we with FMT for the treatment of IBD? Definitely not ready for prime time yet. It's one of the more common things I have people contacting me about, knowing that I do this for C. diff. Um, the FDA actually restricts its use outside of clinical trials. So um, if you're interested in doing FMT as part of a clinical trial, those are ongoing. There are several um, I know, companies trying to develop live microbial products that will maybe potentially be available within the next few years, um, but we're, we're not, not super close to that. Um, FMT does maybe appear to be a promising adjunctive therapy for patients with ulcerative colitis, and I really do believe at some point it will be, uh, there will be some patients who benefit from these microbial manipulations along with their other therapies. Not as much data for Crohn's, really very little for pouchitis. Um, we need to establish who are the patient populations that are gonna benefit what are the protocols? Is it gonna be like a maintenance therapy? Like you have to have an FMT every month or every eight weeks like you do with your infusions. Um, what's the best way to deliver that? Obviously probably capsule versus colonoscopic or a nasogastric tube. And we need to follow people for longer term outcomes. How do they do in the long term? Can we, you know, we can't be naive and think that just changing these bacteria are gonna automatically make things better because there's always a chance. Could you give someone an infection? Could you make their ultimate outcome worse? Um, but this is where we're at with it. Um, it's a very exciting field. It's a, I really feel like we're on this new horizon of medicine with our understanding of the gut microbiome and how many diseases are, even outside of the GI tract, are, are related to dysbiosis. And it's fascinating to me that even over 2,000 years ago, it was said that all disease begins in the gut, and Hippocrates really was right. So thank you very much. These are some people who helped me out with some of the research I do, and I'll be, I guess, taking your questions at the end.